This is Jonko Podcast number 287 with Echo Charles and me, Jonko Willing. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And joining us again is Dave Burke. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. So, listen, if you've been tracking, we have been talking about B.H. Liddell Hart. We've been talking about his strategy of the indirect approach. We've been covering his book, The Strategy of Indirect Approach. Then we rolled into his book, which is just called Strategy. This stuff is... It is just, it, it's it's so important to wrap your head around this stuff. It's a lot of it is counterintuitive when you hear it. It's it's counterintuitive when you hear it. It's sometimes even more counterintuitive when you try and do it. And if you understand it and you do it and you execute it, it is a game changer in the way you execute. And it's also a game changer in the way you think. So if you haven't yet listened to 285 and 286 to learn a little bit about B.H. Liddell Hart, who he is, you know, a, a, a veteran, a soldier, a British soldier, World War I, wounded multiple times, sent back from the front multiple times, sent back to the front multiple times, fought in the Battle of Somme. I mean, just almost his whole battalion wiped out gravely wounded with gas he was gassed i mean been to hell and back quite literally and there's there's not too many people we can talk about obviously that fought in the battle of Somme. and and on the last podcast i was talking about the fact that he you know battle you know we throw the words battle tested around like oh this battle tested how about battle tested in what's actually the worst battle ever that's where he kind of started to think about the strategy and tactics that were being used. This is what sort of, when he talks about the indirect approach, is the antithesis to what World War I was. So if you haven't yet, go back and listen to 285 and 286, and then join us right now with 287. Dave, any intro remarks? No, you, man. You were writing down yeah, that madly just, over just, there thinking about the last podcast that we did and just where he's coming from and I'm actually super stoked to get to these concluding these the end of this section or this 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 trilogy mm-hmm. um because I was saying this last time I think this is all new like I get to hear this in real time and the, the sort of the chronology of your very first introduction from 285 was like, hey, a little bit of the background of Hart, but I didn't really, it didn't really sink in as you were saying it of what you just said, like what he went through. And y- you said it left a mark on him, but I don't, I did not, I did not appreciate the depth of that mark and what it compelled him to do to try to course correct this massive this this massive mistake that that he had to endure in witness and so i i have i think i've been able to understand what he's been saying a lot better as you've been reading it thinking about where he came from Mm -hmm. you you know what i should have done is i should have gone well first of all i should have given a little bit more detail there but i also should have gone back there's so many references to bh liddell hart in so many manuals it's ridiculous yeah and I should have pulled some of those up and said, oh, when we did this Marine Corps manual, when I did this Army manual, here's where this come from. Here's the roots of this statement. Because they, they, cite, they cite him. So I, I guess part of it is there's some other podcasts that I have in the hopper in my mind that I want to do that I really can't do without people understanding this idea of the strategy of the indirect approach. I, I just can't, I can't go forward. It's like I had to do this. So I will go back, I'm sure, and do some more historical context around his life and what he went through. But I also, man, I wanted to get this stuff out there. You know, it's, it's like a prioritize and execute drill, to be quite frank with you. I would, I wanted to get people to understand this and and see how beneficial it can be for their thought process because it's been so beneficial for my for the last 30 years of my life uh, maybe 20 25 years of my life where I realized wait a second 
going direct isn't always the best thing. In fact, the more I figured that out, the more I was like, oh, going direct is usually not the best thing. Quite often, the indirect approach is correct. It's the correct thing in jujitsu. It's the correct thing in battlefield. It's the correct thing as a leader. It's the correct thing interacting with other human beings. So that's kind of where we are. How we got here, you know, a lot, a lot. That's the weird thing about uh, having a podcast and doing things via podcast is part of the benefit is of it is the immediacy of it, right? Like, there's not, you know, if you write a book, if I was to write a book about this stuff, it would take three years, no, two years. Like, if I just was gave up everything else and said I'm going to write a book about this, it would take two years to do to get it to get it written, to get it published, to get it or sort of get it written, edited. Like, there's so much lag time. To do a podcast, it's like, cool, you know what? Here's a book, I've had this book for a long time. I actually gave you my extra copy of this book. So, but to be able to say, you know what? I wanna get this done, now's the time, boom. You can go and execute it. And it's and what you sacrifice is you sacrifice some perfection, right? You sacrifice some perfection because had I sat there and thought about the best way to do this, maybe I would've said, you know what, I need a, I need an, an entire episode about the Battle of the Psalm. I need an entire episode about what gassing does to you. I need to do an episode about his battalion with the Yorkshire Light Regiment, right? And talk about exactly who is in there. There's a whole bunch of different things I could have done. And and it's not, and that's they, that would have made this better. And that's one of the one of the compromises that you make in moving forward and executing. Like, you know what? I'm looking back now, hindsight. 2020, cool, should have done that. Didn't do it, we'll do it in the future. It's the way it goes. Yeah, and even for me, as I as I contemplate what I'm trying to say, you talk about you sacrifice the perfection of your sacrifice. Even the way I'm trying to say what I'm thinking is not exactly right. It's not how I would say it if I spent time to sit down with a pen and paper and write out what I'm thinking or what I'm thinking about or the references I'm making in my head, but to be able to sort of reflect in real time as you're reading this, as inaccurate or, or not as eloquent as I'd like it to be, it's a really cool exercise as a listener of leadership to think about hearing what he's saying, contemplating the frame of reference he had and how it applies to our world, mm-hmm. which is you don't need to be in World War One to recognize how absolutely directly affected you can be by thinking about what he's saying and applying it to your day-to-day life and how you interact with other people, which is kind of crazy to think about it. But it's also true. And I, I guess if there's a problem with any of this, if there's a problem with any of the things that you're saying is that there's nothing sexy about the indirect approach. It doesn't like, it doesn't play well. Like, you're not, I'm going to get up and give a speech about the indirect approach. Men, we're going to subordinate our egos today. Like, it, it, it doesn't, the, the, the language doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't give you that, sat, that immediate satisfaction that people want with Klaus Witzi in total war. But th- th- what's, what's crazy is how, obvious it is how obvious it is to think about how it helps you achieve the ultimate objective, which is winning the war. And how much more satisfying that is than just winning a battle or th- than losing the war. So for, for whatever it lacks in, in the excitement of the language of we're gonna destroy every single aspect of our enemy down to the ground, this actually is the tool that you need to be successful in anything. This is how you actually win. This is how you win. <laughs> yeah, it's very counter-cultural. It's very... Like you said, it doesn't sell well. It doesn't sell well. I mean, you could imagine Stonewall Jackson standing up and saying, all right, guys, the enemy is a half mile down there. We are going to take the fight to them and yeah. people getting fired up. As opposed to saying, hey, the enemy's right down there and we're gonna walk 14 miles right now to go and hit him from where he doesn't really expect it because we don't want to have to face his Really, it, we don't want to have to face his strength. We're a little scared to do that. So we're going to walk around and kind of sucker punch him. You guys with me? Right? It's just like, yeah. it's like, it's really, as opposed to, you know, forward into the breach, right? No, not really. 
I'm gonna sneak around and sucker punch somebody who's with me. <laughs> but it's how you win. So uh, let's jump back into it. Further revision of theory. In trying to revise any theory and readjust it for better balance. Oh, isn't that interesting? We're talking about balance because this everything is a dichotomy. Again, I owe royalties to the to the Liddell Hart family. It is a help to have a background of study in the subject as long as one is willing to modify one's conclusions. Isn't that interesting? We have to actually be willing to, to modify our conclusions, change our mind. I was, so far as I know, the first student of war after 1914 to 1918 to make a re-examination of the prevailing doctrines derived from Clausewitz about the objective in war. After calling it in question in a number of articles in the military journals, I, was, I dealt with it more fully in Paris or the future of war, 1925. This little book began with a criticism of the way that the orthodox aim, quote, the destruction of the enemy's main forces on the battlefield, end quote, had been pursued in World War I, pointing out its indecisive and exhausting results. To, to your point earlier, like, hey, we wanna go and confront the enemy head on. Cool, we did that for three years, uh, four years, and we had not only we had indecisive and exhausting results. We were exhausted and we didn't get anywhere. God, what a, what a freaking sin. What a sin to expend all those lives and be exhausted from it and have no real decisive victory. Continuing, it went on to argue that the advantages of the moral objective showing how armored forces might deliver a decisive blow against the Achilles heel of the enemy army, which is the communication and command centers which form its nerve system, and two, how air forces, besides cooperating in this strategic action, might also strike with the decisive effect direct at a nation's nerve system, and that is its static civil centers of industry. So he's the first guy that said, hey, well, what we did in World War I sucked and we shouldn't do it again. How about we use freaking tanks and aircraft to pierce the enemy and cut off their communication and ruin their industries? Continuing, the general staff prescribed the book for the study of the officers of the first experimental mechanized force when this was formed two years later. The air staff, less surprisingly, made still fuller use of it. There was then a lack of textbooks on air strategy and it fitted the development, the developing trend of their views on the subject. The chief of staff, the chief of the air staff distributed copies to his fellow chiefs of staffs. What I have said now is thus a revision after prolonged reflection of what I wrote a quarter century ago and an avowal of error over part of the thesis. It shows, so he's taking ownership of something that he screwed up. It shows how in correcting the balance, one is apt to tilt too far the other way. This is something I call classic team guy overcorrection. I would make a, I'd go and, guys be coming through my training, they make a mistake, hey, you're micromanaging, all of a sudden they let people do whatever they want, or the opposite. Correcting the balance, one is apt to tilt too far the other way. T.E. Lawrence observed in a letter he wrote me in 1928. This is Lawrence of Arabia. This is a guy that fought in the Arab Revolt, in the Sinai, and Palestinian campaign in World War I. I mean, this guy is legendary. And Lawrence of Arabia says, quote, the logical system of Clausewitz is too complete. What an opening line. The logical system of Clausewitz is too complete. It leads astray his disciples, those of them at least, who would rather fight with their arms than with their legs. What a freaking statement to open up a letter. Rather fight with their arms than with their legs. What an epic statement. Actually, it's kind of a, kind of a, goes in with my Discipline equals freedom field manual talking about, you know, oh, you want to fight? You want to you know self-defense? Cool. You want to punch me? I'm going to run away. <laughs> you want to kick me? Cool. I'm going to run away. I'm going to fight with my legs, not with my arms. 
continuing on. You at present are trying, with very little help from those whose business it is to think upon their profession, to put the balance straight after the orgy of the last war. When you succeed, about 1945, these are like little jokes he's making, because he's writing this in 1928. When you succeed, about 1945, your sheep will pass your bounds of discretion and have to be shivvied back to some later strategist. Back and forward we go, end quote. In 1925, I myself went too far in arguing the advantages of the airstroke at civil objectives, though I did qualify this by emphasizing the importance of executing it in such a way as to inflict the least possible permanent injury for the enemy of today is the customer of the morrow and the ally of the future. Who would think that that's possible? Who would think that Germany would become our ally, right? Who would think that the Japanese, we would rebuild them to a point of like, a, you know, economic power where we're in total cooperation with them. Totally. My belief then was that a decisive air attack would inflict less total damage and constitute less of a drain on the defeated country's recuperative power than a prolonged war of the existing type. In further study, I came to realize that an air attack on industrial centers was unlikely to have an immediate decisive effect and more likely to produce another prolonged war of attrition in fresh form with perhaps less killing but more devastation than from 1914 to 1918, World War I. But when one began to point this out, one soon found that the air staff was far less receptive to the revised conclusion than to the original conclusion. They continued to cherish faith in a speedy decision and when war experience compelled them to relinquish it, they pinned their faith instead on industrial attrition as fervently as the general staff of the last war had done to manpower attrition. We're not learning lessons. (laughs) God. Collective egos at play, just not learning lessons. A lot of this is why, like I said, I've, I've said a couple times now that this book and the, these this strategy is a setup for me for another series of podcasts that I want to do, and it's all going to come so become so clear. Nevertheless, a realization of the drawbacks and evils of taking the civil fabric as the objective does not mean the restoration of battle in the own sense of the objective. The drawbacks of that Klaus Klaus Witsian formula were amply shown in World War I. In contrast, World War II demonstrated the advantage of new potentialities of indirect or strategic action against a military objective, amply confirming what had been forecast in that respect. Is he saying, yeah, I told you so? Yes, he is. He's saying, I told you so. I told you that these things, I told you that this air, that this mechanized, fast moving elements could change the face of war, especially when coupled with air power. I told you so. Even in the past, such action had been effectively exploited by some of the great captains, despite the limitations of their instruments. But now, with the help of new instruments, the airplane, the tank, it proved still more decisive despite the increased strength of tactical resistance. The new mobility produced a flexibility in varying the direction of thrust and threat which disarmed such resistance. And and that's what we talked about in the last podcast. France, Poland, the Balkans, just disarmed resistance. The time has come for a fresh revision of the doctrine of the objective or military aim in light of recent experience and present conditions. It is much to be desired that it should be undertaken on combined service basis to produce an agreed solution for there is a dangerous discordance of doctrines at present. The outlines of a revised theory fitted to present conditions and knowledge have emerged, I hope, in course of this discussion of the subject. The key idea is strategic operation rather than battle, an old term that has outlived its suitability and utility. So get rid of this whole idea of battle. Battles may still occur, but should not be regarded as the aim itself. 
to repeat an earlier conclusion that was strikingly vindicated in World War II. Quote, the, aim, the true aim is not so much to seek battle as to seek a strategic situation so advantageous that it does not of itself produce the decision, that if it does not of itself produce the decision, its continuation by a battle is sure to achieve this. That's what we're looking for. And have your opponent recognize that before the battle takes place. It, optimally, yes. Optimally, they go, you know what, we don't even have a chance. If they don't recognize it, cool. You're in such a good position that it doesn't matter anyways and the battle's over very quickly. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm writing things down. I mean, just the things inside what he just said. How about just the first thing of, of the comment about study is designed to modify conclusions. Not, not to validate your conclusions. <laughs> like, I'm going to go do research and I'm going to literally just overlook and bypass anything that doesn't align with what I already think I know. I'm just like, ah, that, that's not convenient, so I'm going to skip that. So I'm going to find, I'm going to study so I can find information to reinforce what I already know. He's like, no, I'm doing the study to figure out what I, what I thought that's actually wrong. To modify my, to modify my conclusions. The, the inherent humility in that approach is I'm going to study to find out where I'm wrong. How hard that actually is to do. And then he used the air staff, this example, and, and of course, you know, the air staff is a thing that didn't even exist. And now it's this thing where the counterculture, they're, they're the opposing view of, hey, we need to look at these things differently. And then how quickly, how quickly they solidified around their new approach and became the inflexible, rigid, we are going to stick to these conclusions, we're going to stay to these, we are not going to change our, 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 our viewpoint of this. And how quickly that, that process happens too. Human beings do not like God. change. No. <laughs> they really don't. And they really like to dig into whatever they got a hold of. When they got a hold of something, they hang on to it. Totally. It's like trying to pry a toy. It's like a little freaking kid, a, uh, uh, a three-year-old with a rattle. You know what I'm saying? They got that rattle. Go and try and take that take away that from rattle. them. <laughs> Why is that? It's a human instinct to hang on to what you got. And yeah. you see the general staff after 32 years of military service and 150 years of combined military service between these three, four generals. And they, and, and they have that new rattle that they got a hold of and they won't let go of it. Yeah. And they're going to kick and scream. It's disturbing. It's crazy. And he said something too that, that he's referenced You've you've already said it, and and this one kind of finally stuck. Is is he's making the connection to leadership? He he he's not talking about Clausewitz so much. He keeps saying about his students, his disciples, mm -hmm. the influence he had on a generation of leaders, and the 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 tragedy that was created by that, based on Clausewitz's influence over people, and he's made the illusion too, like. That really wasn't his intent. Mm. It wasn't his intent. Oh, he definitely, last podcast, he definitely pointed out that that was not his intent. Totally. But the power, the, for better or for worse, the power of that leadership. And if you have disciples, and you've said this over and over again, and again, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but the, the, this, the, the uneducated disciples are more dangerous than the enemy. Mm -hmm. And to, to just blindly follow the language or the words of the leader and just try to go implement them without truly understanding the context and then the evolving application of that to the world that they're going to be in. It, it's, it, I, mean, I, I put the, from, from those two pages, just pulling out those three, those things and how critical those things are. Can, can, can you fathom the freaking group think that's going on? Check it out. Not only is everyone on my side, bought into this bullshit. So my entire freaking army of millions of people is all bought into this idea and your side and your millions of soldiers and leaders are all bought to the same idea. Imagine how crazy that is. Imagine how crazy it is that our group think is so strong that both opposing sides yeah. both are bought into the same group think at the peril of millions yeah. of soldiers. Like that's nuts to think how strong that group think is to think I'm looking at you and you're doing the exact same thing as me and I'm thinking, well, 
we're just gonna keep doing it. And you're looking at me thinking, we're gonna keep doing it. And neither one of us is able to say, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. Hey, are you looking at what our enemy's doing? This, this, is, this seems kinda dumb. The power of the group think there, the power of, you know, we always talk about, right, you gotta detach and you gotta take a, you know, take a more strategic view. These are the freaking generals. Yeah. On both, both sides, sides at the same time, at the same time, wrapped up in the identical group think when they are getting a daily dose of reality, the, the most stark reality that human beings have ever seen, ever. The most stark reality that human beings have ever seen, they're getting slapped in the face with that on a daily basis and they never look around and say, hey, you know what, this is freaking stupid. What are we doing? This is the sickest group think fathomable. It's crazy. So it's detach. It's detach, but like detaching to the strategic level is not enough. If you're surrounded, if you're completely surrounded, if you're in uh, uh, the, the virtual reality goggles on, right? No matter where you look, it's like you're in the game. You need to take those things off your head. All right, this is the last chapter that we're gonna cover in this book. <clears throat> it's called Grand Strategy. And it's gonna tie into a lot of things. This book is concerned with strategy rather than with grand strategy or war policy. To deal adequately with this wider subject would require not only a much larger volume, but a separate volume. For while grand strategy should control strategy, its principles often run counter to those which prevail in the field of strategy. For that very reason, however, it is desirable to include here some indication of the deeper conclusions to which a study of grand strategy leads. The object in war, so this is an interesting setup, right? The setup is, hey, what I've been talking about at this strategic level, we're actually gonna, we're actually gonna have some principles that are counter to that when we go up one more level. So this is a very interesting setup. The object in war is to attain a better peace, even if only from your own point of view. Hence, it is essential to conduct war with constant regard to the peace you desire. That would appear to be common sense. What are we trying to get done? How can we get it done? Not just to win right now, but how can we set ourselves up in the grand future so that we're doing what we want to, so we're in a situation we want to be in. This is the underlying Klautswitz definition of war as a, quote, continuation of policy by other means, end quote. The prolongation of that policy through the war into the subsequent peace must always be borne in mind. So you, can't, you always have to think about the future. You always have to think about the future. You have to think strategically all the time? <laughs> yeah, all, at all times. <laughs> a state which expends its strength to the point of exhaustion bankrupts its own policy and future. Again, what's the ROI? What's the ROI on what we're doing? If we're expending all of our capital to make something happen and we look up and cool, we made it happen, but we have no capital left. We can't pay our employees. We can't order any more of our supplies. Good job. No, not a good job. If you concentrate exclusively on victory with no thought for the after effect, you may be too exhausted to profit by the peace. While it is almost certain that the peace will be a bad one, containing the germs of another war, this is a, lo a lesson supported by abundant experience. I, I, I brought up this quote again, or one of the previous podcasts about, hey, cool, you won and now you're in charge of a wasteland. How about a leadership capital perspective? Cool, I got Dave to do what I told him to do and now he hates working here and he's not gonna do a good job and he's putting his resume out there to everybody else. Good job, cool, but I got him to do what I want him to do. I, I, I won, but he's got the germs of another war. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, go look at what happened between World War I and World War II. That's yeah. exactly what it is. That's what he's referring to. I mean, there's other examples, but there's 
that's a freaking perfect one. No one was happy at the end of that war. The risks become greater still in any war that is waged by a coalition. For in such a case, a, a too complete victory inevitably complicates the problem of making a just and wise peace settlement. Where there is no longer a counterbalance of an opposing force to control the appetites of the victors, there is no check on the conflicting views and interests between parties of the alliance. What a brilliant statement, right? This is 19... I guess he's when, when, yeah, no, this is this is so this is after World War two. Yeah, I was gonna, it has to be I mean that reference to yeah. America and Russia like yeah. that Yep, cool. Yep. We work together and as soon as we don't have our common enemy anymore yeah. now We're pissed at each other. Yeah <laughs> The divergence is then apt to come so acute as to turn the comradeship of common danger into the hostility of mutual dissatisfaction So the ally of one war becomes the enemy in the next there you go Hello, Soviet Union. Yeah. Versus America. This raises a further and wider question. The friction that commonly develops in any alliance system, especially when it has no balancing force, has been one of the factors that have fostered numerous attempts throughout history to find solution in fusion. So joining together. This is like in a platoon. You have a platoon. If you leave them alone for a little while, they'll start fighting each other. <laughs> That's just what's going to happen. <laughs> no, there's no balancing force. There's no one to go against. Even if it's just the training cadre. That's enough of a, you know, we'll go against those guys or another platoon. Once they're alone, they're going to start fighting each other. So we look, for, we look for solutions in fusion, but history teaches us that in practice, this is apt to mean domination by one of the constituent elements. And although there is a natural tendency toward the fusion of small groups and the larger ones, the usual result of forcing the pace is the confusion of the plans to establish a, a comprehensive political unit. Kind of, a, I will say that's a pretty pessimistic view. It's a realistic view, but it's a pessimistic view. Moreover, regrettable as it may seem to the idealist, the experience of history provides little warrant for the belief that real progress and the freedom that makes progress possible lies in unification. And this is something we need to pay attention to. For where unification has been able to establish unity of ideas, it has usually ended in uniformity, paralyzing the growth of new ideas. And where unification has merely brought about an artificial or imposed unity, it is irksome its irksomeness has led through discord to disruption. I love that that from a leadership perspective, right? We get everyone on board with the plan. Hey, listen, everyone just lock it up. We're going with my plan. It seems to help, right? It seems to help, but by the way, no one's now thinking. And on top of that, people are pissed. Discord. So now as soon as something goes wrong, you know, we got an element that's breaking off. You got people complaining. Why is that? We're trying to force uh, uniformity. We're trying to force people to think the same way. It's a problem. Vitality springs from diversity, which makes for real progress so long as there is mutual toleration. Based on the recognition that worse may come from an attempt to suppress differences than from acceptance of them. Uh, again, if you're a leader and you got someone that's a little outside the lines and all you do is beat them into submission, you're, it's not helping. For this reason, the kind of peace that makes progress possible is best assured by the mutual checks created by a balance of forces alike in the sphere of internal politics and of international relations. So... He goes into a little bit about uh, the, you know, the, the balance of power in politics, right? He says, he says any monopoly of power leads to ever repeated demonstrations of the historical truth epitomized in Lord Acton's famous dictum, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Another conclusion which develops from the study of grand strategy against the background of history is the practical necessity of adapting the general theory of strategy to the nature of a nation's fundamental policy. You've got to make sure you're aligned. Got to make sure you're aligned. It goes into some, the difference between an, an acquisit, a, acquisitive state 
and a conservative state, meaning, hey, my state is going out to acquire other properties, like we're gonna go go on the attack, and a conservative state, which is, hey, we're just trying to maintain what we've got. The acquisitive state, inherently unsatisfied, needs to gain victory in order to gain its object, and must therefore court greater risks in the attempt. The conservative state can achieve its object by merely inducing the aggressor to drop his attempt at conquest by convincing him that the game is not worth the candle. In victory, its victory is in a real sense attained by foiling one's bid, one side's, by foiling the other side's bid for victory. Indeed, in attempting more, it may defeat its own purpose by exhausting itself so much that it is unable to resist other enemies or the internal effects of overstrain. Self-exhaustion in war has killed more states than any foreign assailant. And how often do we see that in companies? How often do we see in companies where they are just going so hard and investing in so many different places and chewing up their teams. We have to, you have to be cognizant of that. Weighing these factors of the problem, it can be seen that the problem of a conservative state is to find the type of strategy that is suited to fulfill its inherently more limited object in the most strength conserving way so as to ensure future as well as presence. Now, th- there's a reason I'm, I, I'm covering this part because of this statement. At first glance, it might seem that pure defense would be the most economical method. But this implies static defense and historical experience warns us that it is dangerously brittle method on which to rely. Economy of force and deterrent effect are best combined in defensive offensive method based on high mobility that carries the power of a quick repost. And a quick repost. A repost is a is a move in fencing. It's a thrust in fencing. So it's cool to think, you know what, we're just gonna conserve, we're gonna stay here, we're gonna be on the defensive. But we have to remember that historically speaking, and when he's talking about historically speaking, he's talking about a massive swath of history that he's looked at to confirm that you got to have some offense. You got to be on offense. And we say this a lot. Like if you're if you're just if you're not growing, you're you're losing totally. He's also clearly learned the lesson that he's kind of accused Clausewitz of not applying, which is the context to the statements where you say, hey, the conservative approach. And oh, by the way, if you're over there thinking that I'm telling you dig in and be conservative, that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And to clarify and have the, the understanding of the comment itself so the comment or the headline doesn't become the story, which he, he referenced so many times of, hey, this statement became its own the interpretation of the statement became its own truth when it's not really what he meant, but he didn't actually take the time to make sure his disciples, his learners understood, I'm not saying dig in. I'm not saying that. And I know if you're hearing that, let me be let me be more clear what this approach really means. And that's clearly a lesson he's taken from the, the, the other leaders that didn't do that and the, the outcomes that that creates when you don't actually explain what you mean. We talked about it almost as a joke inside here of <laughs> don't care or you know hold the line. And if you're hearing... I hold the line on all things. Let me be more clear. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this, this, and this, and this is how you apply this. So I really like the idea that he's he's taking the comment and then giving the context around it so people can understand what he's talking about. The people that are actually studying what he's saying. The idea of the dichotomy of leadership, that idea came to me because I was working with these young junior officers and you know what they want to do? They want to do good. They want to do good. So if you tell them to be aggressive, cool, got it. They are on freaking level 14 berserker mode. They're charging into whatever. You tell them not to move. Um, You tell them, hey, make sure you take the high ground. 
cool. Guess what they're doing? They're running to the top of every freaking hill that they see. Yeah. And so so anything that I would tell them, there was a there was they had a proclivity to take it to the extreme. And so within like one or two iterations at our land warfare training facility, I was like, okay, I gotta tell these guys that there has to be balance. That everything that I'm saying has to be balanced. Every single thing that I'm saying has to be balanced. If you take anything that I'm saying and you take it to an extreme, it's gonna be bad. <clears throat> so I tried to do the same thing. <laughs> it's kind of a universal, oh man, I, I hate to say it's like a cop out. You know, because it's like, well, you know, if your ego's, you're saying ego's no good. No, actually, it's a balance, right? And it kind of sounds like a cop out. Does it sound like a little bit of a cop out, Echo Charles? You seem to agree with me. Yeah, I mean, it can. Yeah, but no. Yes, but no. I mean, it's a real bummer. I think some, uh, not a bummer, but someone will say, "Well, you're saying that, uh, you know, you're saying that the ego's bad, but the ego's, the ego's what? You know, I don't want to hire people that bunch of pushovers." Yeah, it's like. Yeah, I know, man. That's the dichotomy, and they're kind of like, "Oh," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're like they think I don't have that. They forget that I have that, you know. And that's why I feel like bad sometimes pulling the dichotomy card, yeah. but it's the truth. Yeah, probably. the truth is, man. You take something to the extreme, and it's bad. Yeah, that's the truth. You still don't like it? No, I, I agree with you. Uh-huh. Where it's like. You know that it's not a cop out. In fact, it's the opposite of a cop out. Yeah. It's like you got to be real specific and you got to use judgment. You got to, you know, there's just more to it than that. In fact, when someone doesn't recognize the dichotomy, that might be the more of the cop out. It's kind of like, oh, you say go here. Oh, I went there. I went there. That's what you said, right? And it's yeah. like, bro, you got to start using your judgment a little <laughs> bit, you know? Yep. Y- you were You were talking about, does it sound like a cop out? And... In in these scenarios of Top Gun, you know, everything is like a scenario. What do I do in this situation? And how do I react to this? And and like the classic answer, the classic answer was always, it depends. <laughs> it, which had this feeling of like, yeah, it's a cop out. It's a cop out, and like, yeah. oh, you don't really know, or you don't have to be definitive. And because there are times when people want want a black and white, they want a black and white answer. Hey, yeah. if I have this situation, what do I do? It depends. Well, it actually depends, and. But it actually does depend. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah, yeah. it depends. It's not a cop out. It's not a cop out. So Feels like one though. It does, <laughs> and, and because it's not satisfying, and it requires like contemplation and understanding of the nuance. And how did I get here in the first place? What am I trying to accomplish? So I was just thinking to myself when you were talking about this this uh, this feeling of it sounds like a cop out was the 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 answer I gave five thousand times at Top Gun <laughs> to the students is eh, it depends, yeah. <laughs> and then you got to dig in and go through it and go right. well actually in in the case that you're describing uh, this might actually be a better answer than in the same situation but driven by another goal or got there for a different reason hey I might go a different direction here yeah and then you as a leader have to actually apply some judgment in real time as opposed to this situation requires this response well yeah. it's that's not that simple. Hey, assault team leader, what are you doing way back there when there's uh, when they're all bogged down up in the front? Yeah. W- well, you told me not to yeah. get engaged in like the room to room clearance. Totally. Yeah, but they're bogged down. Yeah. That, uh, your example you of where should the platoon commander be in right. a patrol? Well, yeah. it, it depends. Yeah, where it makes sense. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> could be in the front. Could be in the back. Could be in the and, middle. And, and, you know, and and I I guess we've hit this. I'm probably beating a dead horse a little bit, but but the unsatisfying nature of that answer, when I got to um, the basic school, I'm a I'm a I'm a brand new second lieutenant, and uh, we get to the 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 basic school, and right outside of the main headquarters building is this giant bronze statue of a lieutenant, and he's in this pose. He's got his rifle. He's pointing his arm up, and it says "Follow me," you know, mm-hmm. which is what they push you is lead from the front, get out in front of your men, and and in a lot of ways, that's right. That's right mm-hmm. to, to have that, much. but in a lot of ways, it's actually not right. But place yourself where you need to be is nowhere near as cool as, cool as <laughs> follow me, lead from the front. Yeah. But if that's what you, hey, I lead from the front like, cool, you have no idea what's going on back here, and half of your guys just got hammered because of that. There's this, I think, this compulsion, which is why the Klaus Witz thing plays so well to the, 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 even just the catchphrases of leadership, which don't actually serve a leader very well. 
lead from the front. Who's yeah. going to say, like, that's a, that's a terrible leadership philosophy, but actually sometimes you don't want to be in the front. Yeah, which is why I have a section in Leadership Strategy and Tactics, which is actually called lead from the rear. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of like you have to like the more under because there has to be the formula right at some level like obviously at the at the surface the formula is like or you might someone may, might make the mistake the formula is uh lead from the front at all times mm -hmm. right but that's not the formula formula is it depends okay on what then there's a formula under there but then under there you're like okay well if this and this and this oh well it depends a little bit more and the deeper you go there has to be some formula right no. Okay, so that and that's what I was gonna say too. Here, so the the solution. Uh, well, you no, know, wait. I have the formula. You know what the formula is? It's a dichotomy. Or Dave will tell you the formula is. It depends. Yeah. So I feel like you're like yeah. So both those are cop out answers. You don't want to hear them. No, no, Which no. I, no, I'm actually agreeing with you. Like that. That's okay. what I would have said too. It all. It's gonna always depend. Okay. So. It, and also on top of it, there's more than one right answer a lot of the time, or f pretty much all the time, pretty much with very few exceptions, I would think. There are wrong answers. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that, too. Okay, but, and you, but you're saying there's more than one more right than answer? One right, yeah. In many cases, yes. So I would say the solution is the more you understand about all of it, the better decision you can make and the better the better educated you will be on what decision to make given the parameters of all the dichotomies you're dealing with except for the fact that you may not have enough information to make the decision that seems like it's going to be the perfect decision in which case you kind of screwed up by not moving a little bit more quickly and making decision based on the information that you had at that current moment yeah but when i meant when i meant what i meant by knowing like educated yourself, not on any specific scenario, I'm saying on how it works, on the dichotomy of leadership or on the laws of combat or whatever. Okay, yes, <clears throat> understanding, well, yeah, then you're going back to what I said, which is the formula is the dichotomy, yeah. and you gotta be balanced. Yeah. That's the formula, if the formula is be balanced. Yeah, like some, the more you know about the whole game, we'll say, the more you know when you're gonna be on this side of the dichotomy mm -hmm. or leaning on this side of the dichotomy, the more you know about yourself, the more you know about your guys, building relationships, mm -hmm. by the way, the more you know about this, and the more you know about how this works, then you're gonna know more about under what types of circumstances you're gonna lean here or lean there. You know what's cool? We have a business called Echelon Front. Yes, sir. The reason we have a business called Echelon Front is because we have to help leaders work through these issues. We can't give them a formula that they can then apply across the board in all situations. But like you're saying correctly, if they learn and understand the principles, they can start to make better decisions and right decisions based on their understanding of these principles and right. applying them holistically to their scenario. Right, yes, exactly right. Which I was gonna say, yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Where, where do you get the formula from? Oh, you're probably the most educated on this whole game as far as the game goes, mm -hmm. right? So the more you, let's say you consult with a client, right? The more you consult with them, hopefully the more they're gonna learn that same yes. game and they're gonna need you less and less. Yes, See what I'm saying? that's the goal. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right, back to the book. The East Roman Empire was a case where such an actively conservative strategy had been carefully thought out as a basis of war policy, a fact which goes far to explain this empire's unrivaled span of existence. Another example, more instinctive than reasoned, is provided by the strategy based on sea power that England practiced in her wars from the 16th to the 19th century. The value of it was shown by the way that her strength kept pace with her growth while all her rivals broke down in turn through self-exhaustion and war, traceable to their immoderate desire for the immediate satisfaction of outright victory. A long series of mutually exhausting and devastating wars, above all the Thirty Years' War, has brought, had brought statesmen by the 18th century to realize the necessity when engaged in war of curbing both their ambitions and their passions in the interests of their purpose. 
On the one hand, this realization tended to produce a tacit limitation of warfare and avoidance of excesses which might damage after the war prospects. So he's going back in time and saying, look, we kind of learned these lessons. It was a regression. That's why earlier in the last podcast we talked about, he talked about Clausewitz was a regression. We are going backwards. Because they had figured this stuff out, the Thirty Years' War. I mean, that's the 1600s. You got Germany and Sweden fighting Spain and Catholics versus Spain. You got all kinds of crazy warfare going on to no, to no real decisive victory. It's a problem. They realized that. Their ambitions and passions frequently carried them too far so that the return to peace found their countries weakened rather than strengthened. But they had learned to stop short of national exhaustion. Which, again, you th- take that for leadership capital, and we're expending more than we have. At the most satisfactory, at the at, at and the most satisfactory peace settlements, even for the stronger side, proved to be those which were made by negotiation rather than decisive military issue. This gradual education in inherent limitations of war was still in process when it was interrupted by the French Revolution, which brought to the top. Men who were novices in statementship, statesmanship. The directory and its successor, Napoleon, pursued the vision of an enduring peace through war after war for 20 years. There you go. Napoleon going for peace, 20 years of war. The pursuit never led to the goal, but only to spreading exhaustion and ultimate collapse. The bankruptcy of the Napoleonic Empire renewed a lesson that had often been taught before. The impression, however, came to be obscured by the sunset haze of the Napoleonic myth. The lesson had been forgotten by the time it was repeated in the war of, in the World War I. Even after that bitter experience, the statement of the Second World War were no wiser. Although war is contrary to reason, since it is a mean of deciding issues by force when discussion fails to produce an agreed solution, the conduct of war must be controlled by reason if its object is to be fulfilled. And here he goes into how we reasonably conduct war. One, while fighting is a physical act, its direction is a mental process. The better your strategy, the easier you will gain the upper hand and the less it will cost you. Very important thing to think about. Two, conversely, the more strength you waste, the more you increase the risk of the scales of war turning against you. And even if you succeed in winning victory, the less strength you will have to profit by peace. Just, just apply that one to World War I. And it's like, okay, we need to stop this. Three, the more brutal your methods, the more bitter you will make your opponents with the natural result of hardening the resistance you are trying to overcome. Thus, the more evenly the two sides are matched, the wiser it will be to avoid extremes of violence which tend to consolidate the enemy's troops and people behind their leaders. I mean, okay, war, yeah. What about leadership perspective on that one? You know, like the more brutal, the more you, the more you, you know, shut up, Dave, and do what I told you to do. Shut up, team, this is what we're doing. The more you do that, the more resistance you're gonna have to overcome. Four, these calculations extend further. The more intent you appear to impose a peace entirely of your own choosing, by conquest, the stiffer the obstacle you will raise in your path. So when I make a piece that's completely, you know, in my favor, cool, I'm going to end up with problems. And the more I impose a plan on Dave and his team, the more I'm going to end up with problems. And I can see the looks on the people's faces in a company when I tell them that. It's so hard to believe. It's so hard to believe that, hey, actually the more efficient way is to say, hey Dave, how do you wanna do this? It's so hard to believe that. It seems so much more efficient for me to say, hey Dave, here's the plan, shut up and do it. Here, give this to your team, here's the orders, go execute. 
Which is funny because people go, oh, you know, these military, these military way of leading wouldn't work in the civilian world. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's always fun. Leif's like, yeah, yeah, this is what, exactly what Jocko did with me. He'd be like, hey, how do you want to do it? And I'd be like, oh, this sounds like a good plan. Okay, okay cool. <clears throat> Five, furthermore, if and when you reach your military goal, the more you ask of the defeated side, the more trouble you will have and the more cause you will have to provide for an ultimate attempt to reverse the settlement achieved by war. Again, when you impose your plan on people, when you impose your will on people, there will be organ rejection of that. Force is a vicious cycle or rather a spiral unless its application is controlled by the most carefully seasoned calculation. Just just think about that. There's a common thing I tell clients. Minimum, you want to lead with minimum force required. That's how you want to lead. If I don't have to say anything, that's the best. If I have to say, hey, this is maybe an idea. If I get to a point where I have to bark and order at someone and tell them, shut up and do what I told you to do, that's bad. That's, that's the vicious circle of force. We don't like it. Thus, war, which begins by denying reason, comes to vindicate it, vindicate it throughout all phases of the struggle. The fighting instinct is necessary to success in the battlefield. So the fighting instinct, we gotta be ready to fight. The fighting instinct is necessary to success in the battlefield. Although even here, the combatant who can keep a cool head has an advantage over the man who sees red. So that's his little caveat. And then he says, but the fighting instinct should always be ridden on a tight rein. The statesman who gives that instinct its head loses his own. If you just want to scrap, cool. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose your own head. He is not fit to take charge of the fate of a nation. Victory in the true sense implies that the state of peace and of one's people is better after the war than before. Victory in this sense is only possible if a quick result can be gained or if a long effort can be economically proportioned to the national resources. How much are you investing? How much are you investing of capital from your company? How much are you investing in leadership capital? ROI, where's it at? The end must be adjusted to the means. We throw that one out all the time. And it's, and it's got like the connotations of being a wimp. Mm-hmm. Focus on your goal. There's 48 freaking uh, 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 inspirational memes sure. a day. Sure. Set your goal and never fear from it. Cool. I got a better idea. How about the end must be adjusted to the means? <laughs> right? It's this not very inspirational. I want that Lambo. <laughs> I want a dream board. I got a Lambo and I got an infinity pool. <laughs> cool. Hell yeah. How's that Wendy's salary kicking in? <laughs> right? Adjust your means a little bit, man. Yeah. Adjust the end to fit the means. Yeah. Sure. Oh, this is this is, again, no one's there's no there's no there's not one single inspirational meme on the gram that says <laughs> that says the end must be adjusted to the means. No yeah, one says that. Actually, it's the opposite as far as in the inspirational uh, quotes industry. Well, for lack of a better term, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. Actually, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, hey, basically, it's like, okay, adjust the means to the means, right? Or the ends to the means, right? So it's kind of like, hey, don't freaking have this goal that's like unrealistic. Essentially, essentially, like, yeah. Fact, like uh, it's unrealistic, yeah. right? Like. It, it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible. You have an irresponsible goal right yeah. there. You can like whatever, kill yourself doing it, right? You should go in the comment should be like you're dumb. It should <laughs> be, right? Given that. <laughs> right? But if you say it, but they'll talk There's about There's someone like, right now that's going to hear this and be like that's oh, kind of yeah. bullshit. Uh, you yeah. got to fucking set your goals. <laughs> you're down. Oh yeah, if you're down for the thing and I get it because double tap. 
a heart like if you want to be a <laughs> you know for your first hundred million. Oh yeah, F- yeah, fully. bro. There's people that t- tap that twice. Oh yeah, right, hundred percent. Yes, sir. And and like for a moment, they're kind of like pumped. Yeah, I'm sure they're pumped the whole time <laughs> <laughs> until the ends, really. But the, uh, no, well, if you're the guy, if you're the guy who says this, what mm-hmm. this book is saying, hey, right. like the end must be adjusted hey, to the means. That's a good goal. Like that's a lofty goal, which yeah. you know, obviously, I you can't hate on lofty goals. Wait, that's not even really a lofty but, goal. That's just a realistic thing to do as right. a human. But the realistic we should start guy, making realistic human memes. Yeah, well, in a way, <laughs> you know, you know the first one will be the nope. end must be adjusted to it's, the mean. It's very not inspirational. They would get downvoted. Yeah, you'll you'll be branded as the hater, really. Oh, like that's what that's oh. the point where they they'll brand you as a hater. God. It's like everyone's always hating. And, and your you parents. know what? This goes into uh, the whole idea, Dave, that you were talking about of like about hey this isn't really sexy this is the absolute like non this is getting downvoted this is getting haters oh yeah and and what's interesting is who you gonna who's gonna get the up vote right yeah this person is getting you're getting hated on oh yeah because you're like actually it's an unrealistic goal you should check yourself right oh the downer <laughs> the doubter right oh yeah oh, the doubter. All the people who yeah and yeah. the thing is i get it because every <laughs> once in a great while you'll get someone who achieved this super lofty goal mm-hmm. not to say that they didn't adjust the ends to the means because mm-hmm. they had the means apparently at the end of the day the means were there because the end is there too mm-hmm. right but here's the thing they had that uh un un we should make say? uninspirational <laughs> memes. We'll just say realistic, realistic memes. memes. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> nonetheless, they they achieved that goal that was kind of untip, not typically realistic. It was uh-huh. unrealistic, right? Comparatively speaking, or whatever. And they achieved no. it. I, I mean, we could easily argue that, like, oh, this person did this because they had the meme. The means, means yeah. right? The, well, that they is had the, point. the intellectual horsepower. That's, they had the educational right. thing. They yeah. had they had all these things set up. Oh, so yeah. it was actually a realistic goal. I know that. That's what I'm saying. Where, but they'll take the 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 crazy quote unquote unrealistic uh, ends, right? The goal will say mm-hmm. president, but well, that's the one, right? The classic president of the United States. Mm-hmm. You can do anything you want. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to set my goal the highest I possibly can in life, president of the United States, mm-hmm. right? So they'll be like, all right, cool. Therefore, we should all essentially set goals as high as President of the United States, right? Okay. That's kind of the inspirational <laughs> message, right? Okay. Meanwhile, the very few individuals that became President of the United States had the means. So their ends technically, by definition, were adjusted. Their ends were adjusted to the means because they had the means. See what I'm saying? But not everyone has the means. Oh, yeah, 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 so you got to adjust saying. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, everyone's saying, no, 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 no. Don't if he can it. do it, I, I can, can do it. it too, right? Which, yeah. hey, I'm not saying they can't. I'm not even saying that. But I'm saying, hey, man, <laughs> you got to be really realistic on that kind of stuff. Yeah. See what I'm saying? But then if you say that, you just can't say that out loud. You know what's really crazy is, like, I just got slapped in my own face thinking about this because we're kind of joking about this. Sure. But what he's saying and what he saw was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers that were killed because the leadership didn't adjust the ends to the means. Totally. Which is crazy to think about. And and as you guys were talking, I was thinking in my mind, like people have figured this out. There there are even phrases out there. The one I kept thinking of as you're talking about this is, I remember the phrase, live within your means. Mm. Like I've heard that's a phrase. What it's not is it's not hanging on a poster in any kid's bedroom anywhere. Yeah. Like I don't go to bed at night like it's a nine year old going, I'm gonna live, live within, within my, my means. <laughs> the irony inside that is the best way to actually ultimately expand your means over time so your means get greater and greater is to do exactly that. Yeah. Like that's that's the trick to it is is the the dissatisfaction of the reality is something people overlook and the 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 unfunny part of that which is the sobering piece that you just mentioned is that it can actually lead people down a path to do exactly what you just said which which almost seems not possible except for the fact that these that he specifically lived that in a way that goes oh, what are we doing here 
What are we doing? What are we expending? To and, and what are we accomplishing by doing that? So it wasn't just the national exhaustion. It was the national exhaustion with nothing to show for it. And, and then the scale of that, which is which is impossible, Obscene. as yeah. opposed to, hey, why don't we operate within our means here? Why don't we do that? Yeah, and if you fast forward the kid, if there was a kid that had a poster on their wall that said live within your means, and therefore they're saving and they're putting together, and you look at them in 20 years, <laughs> and they're in a way better position than someone that was that. like, you know, you need the Lambo yeah, <laughs> or whatever, yeah. right? Because oh, yeah. they're gonna end up in debt. Yeah. And they can't invest properly and they, they have to work a job that they don't really like and it's a job That's a dead-end job like all these things add up You said something about you being an NBA basketball player, mm -hmm. right? I would say on record on a Inspirational or demotivational post saying hey, bro. That's unrealistic. Yeah. I would tell you that yeah, yeah, and I think factually it is unreal well as far as factually goes, it is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would tell a high school kid that when he's really into basketball. I don't know if I would I would say that. Mm -hmm. Like it'd be unrealistic in certain ways, like if under certain circumstances or whatever. But given like how you consider it, most people how they get into like professional sports, or whatever mm -hmm. they work hard, they really love the sport. You know, they go through trials and tribulations or whatever, and they end up making it kind of a thing. So if you get someone that are, that's kind of in the beginning of that type of path, right. where that path is not straight up blocked off for whatever reason, yeah. like it would be in your case, I wouldn't really say that's unrealistic. The point is there are really cases where it's unrealistic. So if you tried to be an NBA player, hired the best coach in the world. I, I get it. You would wind up exhausting all it, your resources. I should, trying I to should do adjust it. my... My end to my, my end. Yes, right. sir. You might want to make sure that your kid, who you don't want to stifle that dream, you might want to make sure that they're not putting all their eggs in that one basket, mm. too. Like, hey, listen, go for it. But you're not going to drop out of school. Yeah. You're not going to stop doing this and this with the, the ultimate meme of focus on your goals and block out every distraction. So I, I, I'm done with school because school's stupid because yep. school ain't gonna help me be, be an NBA player. Meanwhile, you're five, six, you're done growing, you're not that good of a shot, but you've got this this passion, you might wanna keep that kid on the track of, hey, cool, I'm not here to crush your dreams. Yep. However, comma, let's consider some other things as you're doing that. Actually, you should never have a plan B. That means you're not fully committed you to go. your plan yeah, A. That's right. Yeah, you well, you got a plan another, B? I another, guess you're not committed to plan another A. Another inspirational yeah. meme that's for right. you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, he addresses some of this here. Uh, going back to the book, failing a fair prospect of such a victory. So the end must be adjusted to the means. Failing a fair prospect of such a victory, why statesmanship will miss no opportunity for negotiating peace. Peace through stalemate based on a coincident recognition by each side of the opponent's strength is at least preferable to peace through common exhaustion and has often provided a better foundation for lasting peace. It is wiser to run risks of war for the sake of preserving peace than to risk run the risk of exhaustion in war for the sake of finishing with victory. A conclusion that runs counter to custom, but is supported by experience. So it's it's better to like, maybe we don't have war and we just kind of maintain peace with kind of what I've got. That's a better deal than, you know what? We're just gonna, we're gonna exhaust ourselves and hope for some kind of a victory. Yeah. Perseverance in war is only justifiable if there is a good chance of a good end. The prospect of a peace that will balance the sum of human misery incurred in the struggle. Like each one of these statements, Dave, you just shake your head knowing where it came from. Yeah. That's all I'm thinking is every one of these is, is what, he, what this comes from and just how savage that experience had to have been for him. Indeed, Deepening the study of past experience leads to the conclusion that nations might often have come nearer to their object by taking advantage of a lull in the struggle to discuss a settlement than by pursuing the war with the aim of victory. History, so look, man, you gotta look for those opportunities. 
We got a little low. Hey, are, you want to keep going with this? Or you want to maybe stand down? History reveals also that in many cases, a beneficial peace could have been obtained if the statesmen of the warring nations had shown more understanding of the elements of psychology in their peace feelers. So you get the peace feelers out there like, what, what, what? let me sense about what's happening here. And people don't have good understanding of their peace. They don't recognize their peace feelers. Their attitude has commonly be, been too akin to, to that seen in the typical domestic quarrel. Right? So now we've got to fight with our wife. Each party is afraid to appear yielding, with the result that when one of them shows any inclination towards co- conciliation, this is usually expressed in language that is too stiff, while the other is apt to be slow to respond, partly from pride or or obstinacy and partly from a tendency to interpret such a gesture as a sign of weakness when it may be a sign of returning to common sense. Uh, Classic, right? I'm not gonna apologize. Just say you're sorry. (laughs) Yeah, just say you're sorry. They'll look weak. (laughs) Thus the fateful moment passes and the conflict continues to the common damage. Right, we are killing ourselves over something that we could easily say, hey, look, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Mm. Rarely does a continuation serve any good purpose where the two parties are bound to go on living under the same roof. This applies even more to modern war than to d- domestic conflict since the industrialization of nations has made their fortunes inseparable. It is the responsibility of statesmanship never to lose sight of the post-war prospect in chasing the mirage of victory. Where where the two sides are too evenly matched to offer a reasonable chance of early success to either, the statesman is wise who can learn something from the psychology of strategy. It is the elementary principle of strategy that if you find your opponent in a strong position, costly to force, you should leave him a line of retreat as the quickest way of loosening his resistance. Get person a way out. It should equally be the principle of policy, especially in war, to provide your opponent with a ladder by which he can climb down. Give people a way out. Give your wife a way out in that argument. Give your subordinate a way out in that argument give your boss a way out don't make them dig in don't make them fight to the death the question may arise as to whether such conclusions based on the history of war between so-called civilized states apply to the conditions inherent in a renewal of the type of purely predatory war that was waged by the barbarian assailants of the roman empire or the mixed religious and predatory war that was pursued by the fanatical followers of Mohammed. In such wars, any negotiated peace tends to have in itself even less than the normal value. It is only too clear from the history that states rarely keep the faith with each other, save in so far and so long as their promises seem to them to combine with their interests. (laughs) That's a good thing to note, right? I'm not going to keep any promises if they're not f- for my benefit. That's what history tells us. Yeah. And now we're so now we're talking about extremists, whether it's the barbarians attacking uh, the Romans or the Islamists attacking the West back in the day. But the less that a nation has regard for moral obligations the more it tends to respect physical strength the deterrent power of a force too strong to be challenged with impunity so you got somebody that's not gonna you know you make peace with them but you don't trust them guess what you better be strong people that don't people that don't respect the moral obligation they respect strength In the same way, with individuals, it is a matter of common experience that the bully type and the robber type hesitate to assail anyone who approaches their own strength. Check. You don't see the bully picking on the big yoked up guy with cauliflower ears. It is folly to imagine that the aggressive types, whether individuals or nations, can be bought off or, in modern language, appeased since the payment of Dangeld simulates stimulates a demand for more Dangeld. What's Dangeld, you asked? Mm. 
it's Viking protection money. Like, hey, you can live here. I need some dang geld. You got to pay me a little bit of, you know, a little bit of something, something. Okay. And what does that do? Makes me want more. Oh, the Viking? Yeah. Mm. The dang. I asked you, like, I, I need some protection money from you. You know, you can, you can work this corner, but, you know, right. you got to give me my cut. Yeah. What does that make me want? More cut. Yeah, yeah. So you can't buy them off. Mm. But they can be curbed. Their very belief in force makes them more susceptible to the deterrent effect of a formidable opposing force. This forms an adequate check except against pure fanaticism, a fanaticism that is unmixed. So you get pure fanaticism, it doesn't matter if I'm going to kill you or not, you're going to come. While it is hard to make real peace with the predatory types, it is easier to induce them to accept a state of truce and far less exhausting than an attempt to crush them whereby they are, like all types of mankind, infused with the courage of desperation. So we have to be strong. Mm -hmm. You have to be strong. And look, if you're stronger than these predatory fanatics, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to go to war with them because they're going to fight desperately. But if you're strong and you can keep them in check, that's sort of a good balance of power that's acceptable. Yeah. I I don't know how many more you've got on this, but I'm just I'm thinking of all the things he's describing, all, all the behavior and the reaction, the action and the reaction. It, it, it's all human nature. It's all this is how a this is how they will respond to this. And you know, the repetitiveness, and it, it, he keeps coming back to this idea that, like, hey, this is, not a, this is not a sample size of one. This isn't just one thing that's happened in history. And I think that's the power of the idea of human nature is this is how people will react. This is how people will respond. And if you understand human nature, I mean, that to us is, is, is the foundation of leadership. This is a human nature endeavor. Understanding how people will react. And anytime we behave in the extremes, there will be a reaction to that. To, to us mm-hmm. operating in the extremes, there will be a natural human reaction to some other extreme. And he's like, hey, do you wanna subdue human nature? Be moderate. Limit the natural reaction. And, hey, have a little bit of something over here, have a little something over here, but just listening to all those things you're saying is like human nature, human nature, human nature, human nature. Yep. And the response, be balanced, be balanced, be balanced, be balanced. Be find, balanced. Be, be, it's fine to be in the middle, to limit, to, to minimize the reaction that you're going to get. Total war. Cool. Yeah. You win. Guess what you got now? You got an insurgency. It's going to last for 20 years. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and is that really what you want? Yeah. Or could you maybe operate with some restraint, understanding that what you're really trying to do is not beat them. What you're really trying to do is create a peace for a couple of decades maybe? Mm-hmm. Could you could you think of the long game here? Again, that's probably not going on a poster somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you're not getting recruited into the Marine Corps yeah. with that one. Yeah. Here's a little, um, maybe a little warning for us. The experience of history brings ample evidence that the downfall of civilized states tends to come not from the direct assaults of foes, but from internal decay combined with the consequences of exhaustion in war. Yeah, that's a little warning. A state of suspense is trying. And and his usage of the word suspense there is like mental indecision. A state of suspense or mental indecision is trying it has often led nations as well as individuals to commit suicide because they were unable to bear it but suspense is better than to reach exhaustion in pursuit of the mirage of victory that's a bold statement so indecision can be so bad this this existence of indecision can be so bad that you, you, you can destroy yourself. You can kill yourself. You want to kill yourself. But that's actually better than to just exhaust yourself completely in pursuit of a, of a victory that can't be had. 
What's you know what's counterintuitive about that is you know this idea that humans we need a goal. We need something to go towards, right? We need a goal. We need something. We we want something. We want to struggle. We want to fight. He, what he's saying here is like, well, let's think twice about that one. Let's think twice about that one. And I think it's probably because he understands what the true exhaustion of a state looks like uh, on a scale that most people can't comprehend. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and he said this before. I read yeah, it, it. The mirage of victory. The mirage. Yep. What you are seeing, this goal that you're working towards, it's actually not a thing. It's not a real thing. It's a mirage. And you've convinced yourself victory for me is I defeat Jocko. That's victory. And I am going to move towards that until it happens. But that's actually not a real thing. It's not a real thing. Uh, Yeah. It's not a real thing. And what you'll end up with is an insurgency. (laughs) Or exhaustion. Or exhaustion or or whatever else. Or or you'll rule over the barren wasteland that I left. Right. Moreover, a truce to actual hostilities enables a recovery and development of strength while the need for vigilance keeps a nation on its toes. So we're looking for a truce. It's okay. Peaceful nations are apt, however, to court unnecessary danger because when once aroused, they are more inclined to proceed to extremes than predatory nations. Interesting, right? This is like the guy that's sort of quiet and keeping to himself. But when you piss him off, <laughs> you know, then they freaking go ham. <laughs> that's a technical definition as well. <laughs> For the latter, making war as a means of gain are usually more ready to call it off when they find an opponent too strong or too easily overcome. And this is really the last point f- for this book that we're gonna talk about. It is the reluctant fighter, impelled by emotion and not by calculation, who tends to press a fight to the bitter end. Thereby, he too often defeats his own end, even if he does not produce his own direct defeat. For the spirit of barbarism can be weakened only during a cessation of hostilities. War strengthens it, pouring fuel on the flames. So by attacking people, by attacking this, the, barb, the, the barbarians, when we attack them, we make them stronger. We make them fight harder. War makes them st- stronger, makes them fight, makes them resist, pours fuel on the flames. We can only weaken them by by backing off a little bit. Again, this is not the recruiting poster. It's, it's and it's so <laughs> counterintuitive. It's, it's so, so counterintuitive. counterintuitive to the natural reaction of push harder, be more dominant to get to get the outcome that you want. <sighs> so look, we're we're here for the truce. <laughs> we're we're here for the compromise. Like yeah. they, they, it's just it's so yeah. counterintuitive to what we what we preach, what we want, yeah. which is to, total victory. I, I like total victory. That yeah. sounds good. It's a mirage. Yeah, just never compromise. <laughs> you, you know, no compromise. That's a that's another great yeah. you know inspirational me because there's none that say, hey, it's really good to compromise oftentimes and kind of take what you can get and work out a good deal and you know that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get hammered for this. Oh yeah, some inspirational <laughs> meme people are gonna be mad at us. Yeah. And what's crazy is, I mean, you, you probably you know open up uh, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. We'll pull out some stuff like this. I got all kinds of stuff in there. Getting crazy. Yeah. Right. Sure. Are you gonna make me crack it open and start reading <laughs> stuff? No, I'm not. Guilty okay. as charged. Yep. I'm kind of wanting to. Well, the good thing about your book is that it's not <laughs> its not like you've done a good job, whether it be in the book itself or... <laughs> Compromise. <laughs> Page 32, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. When working with other people in dynamic... Oh, this is see, this is kind of cool. 
Here's what it says. This is just the first thing I opened up to. When working with other people and dynamic situations and relationships and deals, a person, especially a leader, must compromise. Mm-hmm. Finding the common ground between teams, merging different approaches to the same problem, bridging personalities with people who might not get along, reaching agreements in courses of action. All of these require compromise. And in many cases, a failure to compromise is a failure to succeed. I guess maybe I'm wrong. Yep. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about me writing stuff that's inspirational meme crap. Mm-hmm. But those are external compromises with other people, other humans that have their own personalities and ethos and issues. And compromises needed to unify. So work with them, compromise. So to work with them, compromise is a must. Mm-hmm. Not with yourself. <laughs> and then I wait. But internally, it's different. With yeah. myself, I have to hold the line. There are areas within myself where I cannot compromise. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to train hard. I'm going to improve myself. I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I'm going to confront my own mistakes. I'm going to own my mistakes and confront them. I'm going to face my demons. I'm not going to give up or give out or give in. I'm going to stand. I'm going to maintain my self-discipline. And on those points, there will be no compromise. Not now, not ever. Whoa. That's pretty inspirational. Pretty, uh, we might go meme on that one. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, if you go from the headline to the conclusion there and skip the content in the middle where it says compromise, not now, <laughs> not ever, yeah. you got a little cross yeah, yeah. issue here where your disciples yeah. are like, I didn't quite read the context, yeah. but I saw the page that said compromise. You know yeah. how it ended? It said, not now, not ever. Yep. It's so not good. I think if we go through this book, here's one called Fight go down swinging and I'll tell you if you fight with all you have more often than not you won't go down at all you will win but you have to make that attitude part of your everyday life do the extra repetition run the extra mile go the extra round make the right choices give the full measure I'm in the game I think I'm in the inspirational meme game yeah you are but what I was gonna say is like yeah yeah you do that but the good thing about having a whole book and a whole podcast mm. and a, eight million other books is, or whatever, you're going to explain the whole situation rather than just have the one post. You see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, look, the, the the entire book is predicated. I think the opening salvo you have is this is about you. And you say, I am nothing but weakness. I am nothing but but flaws. I am nothing but these things. So this is the this is the this is what you are with yourself, with self-discipline as opposed to how I'm gonna treat other people around me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, this is aimed internally. T- totally, yes. I mean, in a literal sense. And that fight is against, I mean, it's even in the video that we show it at the must, I am nothing but weakness. And I'm gonna fight against that weakness, that compromise, all those things that my, my mind is telling me to do to myself, which is, I think also you could look at the terms like the difference between between imposed discipline and self-discipline mm. Imposed discipline does not work and self-discipline does it's that as simple as truth. that And as we impose ourselves on other people in war in Leadership in parenting in insert any human interaction human and another human mm-hmm. when you impose your discipline when you impose yourself on them in the end you will lose but it's much more efficient just to impose your way. Yeah, it's faster. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so there we go. That's what we're going to cover for this book. Uh, I've kind of, I guess, foreshadowed some of the other things we'll do in the future. And it's one of those things. If you can make, if you can take these lessons, these lessons written in blood, not just in one war, but in war after war after war. And the exclamation point of World War One. You can learn a lot, and you can apply this. And we know that it's not as striking. We know it's not as sexy. We know it's not as meme worthy as some of the more um, direct approaches. We know that, but this is. To give the original name, this is How to Win Wars. (laughs) With that, speaking of winning wars, Echo Charles, we want to, you know, win the war on ourselves. We do. 
Yeah, the you know, when you say win wars, right? Win wars. You don't. T- uh, the, this is what the one of the takeaways that I think. Hey, dang, that's something good to remember. Mm-hmm. Where when you think about warfare and winning the war, you don't think about the peace that afterwards, mm-hmm. you know, like the aftermath. So I grew up on Kauai. Mm-hmm. You, knew that, you know that. So when, the thing about Kauai is like, if you get in a fight with someone and you don't resolve it in a peaceful way, I don't care how. I don't care if it's the kind, hey, we don't like each other for no good reason and we just fight him like, okay, we're cool, we fought and we're done. If you don't resolve it in some peaceful way, you got to deal with somebody's cousin, somebody's brother, mm-hmm. somebody's, you know, whoever, neighbor who's just down for the cause or whatever, and you're going to see him again too. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. You go to the store, he's going to be there mm-hmm. like next week or whatever, you know. So it's kind of one of those things where it's kind of in the back of your mind. If I'm going to fight this guy, I, I sort of got to deal with that, contend with that long that long game. You know? Is there a methodology to get that resolved post-fight? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I th- all the fights I've ever been in have never been, like, lasting. Like, it'd be like a fight and then we're friends afterwards. But I was a kid, so I, have very little un- mm-hmm. li- I had very little understanding of that. But... Nonetheless, the point is where that's something, when we think of warfare, we think of, oh, defeat, crush your enemies, have them driven before you. Mm-hmm. you see what I'm saying? And we don't think about that. Oh, wait, yeah. and, you know, you got your neighbor, his freaking dog yeah. or whatever is barking, his tree is growing over your fence, and you're gonna, you guys are warring yeah. years. It's like, bro, you don't have to do that. You know, you got to live next to that guy. Yeah. When you go to the post office or whatever, you go to your car and you see him getting in his car too, you're like, oh, it's all awkward or whatever. Like, bro, you don't have to do it like that, you know? Are you really going to achieve the peace that you hoped for by beating this dude's yeah. ass right now? Yeah. Because just... chances are you're not really, if you think a little bit, chances are you're not thinking, hey, I'm going to go the distance right now. Like, I'm, no. I'm ready to just go. I'm ready to go all in. I'll yeah. fight every cousin, nephew, <laughs> brother, sister. No. I don't care. Like, no. but that's where you can end up. Yeah. We, oh, don't yeah. Want, we don't want to end up. In there. fact, that's a common thing, especially like with the neighbors or whatever. Oh, I'm going to tell them off. It's usually that kind where I'm mm-hmm. going to tell them off. I'm not going to take that from him or her, whatever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, meanwhile, 10, 20, 30 years you're worrying with this neighbor right next door, by the way. The feud. The you're feud. feud. Man. That's, yeah, it's total, total common thing, you know, when all you got to do is be like, hey, like, you know, make a peaceful discourse. And you guys can live uh, neighborly, you see what I'm saying? Preferable. But anyway, yeah, so the point is, like, thinking about that aftermath or considering that it's a thing, you know? I'm going to do that. Like, if you roll with someone in jiu-jitsu and you fight dirty because you want to win, you want to, mm. you know, do that stuff. And then when you're done rolling, you tap them out, hell yeah. Everyone's talking about you. Oh, yeah, you're dirty. Nobody respects you. Nobody likes you in the community. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Got to be careful with that kind of stuff. All right. So how can we, you know, win the war that we're all fighting kind of on an individual basis day to day with um unmitigated daily discipline in all things i like it i like it so when i say daily discipline i mean the energy drink boom so it's healthy for you and it gives you the payoff that you'd expect from an energy drink See what I'm saying? So this is good news for us. Anyway, so on this path that we're all on, we need some supplementation. We could benefit from supplementation, mm-hmm. right? So we got Choco Fuel to the rescue, in a <laughs> sense. Got energy drinks for you, healthy, good short-term and long-term. We got protein, additional protein. Tastes real good. We got dessert, basically. Dessert. That's good for you. Yeah, good short-term, good long-term. The aftermath of the milk of the protein, the dessert, it's good aftermath. It's a peace, uh, peaceful truth. See what I'm saying? Yeah, pe- very peaceful truth. Yes, sir. Also, when That's your joints good. act up, when your immunity acts up, we got some stuff for that How as well. How about you don't let your joints act up? How yeah. about we get into a continual state of peace with our joints? Yeah, yeah, like a preventative that's what I'm thinking. Uh, situation. Because to wait, oh, waiting man. for your joints to act up is a bad call. I, and I was about to say preemptive strike on your joints. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I mean, you're like, hey, how about a cooperative, you know, you're, yeah. you're going down like the, the, oh, yeah. the, the, the right path here. I'm like preemptive strike. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're joint more warfare. attuned with yeah, uh, like, hang on. Marine yeah. Corps recording per, poster as it is, opposed to. It the, is called joint warfare. I it mean, is called joint warfare. I know, bro. Preemptive, so there we go. Preemptive strike on joint issues. Joint issues. Yeah, you got to beat them down. Beat them into submission. Yeah, yes. Beat, into <laughs> beat <laughs> inflammation into submission with joint yeah. warfare. Don't wait until you have joint issues. That's a dumb call. That is a dumb That's call. what Echo Charles just told you to do. 
I'm I'm here to help. You know. <laughs> All right, I'm just saying, hey, if you don't want to worry about joint issues, you take the joint warfare and the super krill oil. Yes, that's it. If that's you don't want to worry about colds or sicknesses or flus or whatever, you take the vitamin D3. You take the cold war. That's going to help you. Yeah. Don't preemptive worry about strike. That. Preemptive Go strike. Go to war. Go to war. Total war. Yeah. Fully. Um, so you can get all the stuff at Vitamin Shop. You can get all this, uh, the energy drinks at Wawa. And you can get all of everything on jockofuel.com. And if, look, if you want to save a little bit of money and you want to save brain power, you get a subscription. Get a subscription to whatever you want. It'll show up at your house once a month. Boom. There's the Mulk. There's the Joint Warfare. There's the Super Krill. There, it's coming in. Yeah. Coming out, you don't worry, worry about it. You can focus on something else. You can prioritize and execute some other tasks. Yep. Speaking of brain power, Origin USA. They got some American-made stuff. How does that have to do with brain power? Right, you know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you <laughs> don't know. American, American-made American denim, as far as jeans go. I was going to call you on a couple of those last podcasts where, you know, speaking of whatever, I'm yeah. going to talk about something totally different. That's yeah. sort of like become your new mode. No, Yeah, because you got to make the association. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's speaking of pickles. That's the brain power. OriginUSA.com. You can get some jeans. American-made denim, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Yeah. As far as American-made stuff goes, you got the denim, you got your jeans, you got your geese rash guards, you got athletic wear, you got belts, you got boots. All made in America, Origin USA, boom. See, see what I'm saying about the brain power? Yeah, that was definitely had a lot to do with brain power. Also, uh, speaking of <laughs> a lot of to do. The brain power you expended <laughs> making that connection is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> speaking of ridiculous, <laughs> Jocko a, has a store. It's half a watt. <laughs> it's called Jocko Store. <laughs> if you want your discipline equals freedom shirts. Right. Merch. As far as merch goes. You know, shirt that says good on it. Boom, you can get it there. You can get all kinds of stuff. Uh, hats. Shirts, still sell hats, that? hoodies, rush still guards. Still sell the shirt with shorts. your head on it. Do you still sell the shirt with your head on it? Dang. You design that shirt. Do you still sell that shirt with your head on it? Yeah, we still sell it. Cool. Best seller. Really? Yes. Uh, it sells double the amount of the one with your head on it. <laughs> <laughs> if you must know. Yeah. Nonetheless, yes, the, sh the shirt that Jocko designed with my head is on it on there. Dang. A bunch of other stuff on there as well. We have a subscription situation for the shirt. Some other shirts. They're exclusive. I said it. Exclusive. Okay. It's called the Shirt Locker. If you're part of the Shirt Locker, you have you get one of these shirts every month. It's a new, they're new kind of creative, for lack of a better term, <laughs> designs. If you're not part of the Shirt Locker, you don't get them. Sorry. It's like okay. the nature of the locker. See what I'm saying? Okay. You went a little more simple this time, which was good. I, yeah. I appreciated the simplicity of it. You still can't describe what the shirts are with any with any sensible yeah words. Well, well some <laughs> things can't be explained. You know, that's to even their better. Full that's even capacity. better. I like that. Yeah. Even you, to say, look, I can't really explain this, but trust me, you know, you're gonna want one of these shirts. Okay, these shirts cannot be explained, Jocko. Oh, they okay. can only be experienced. Dang. So you make this choice whether or not you experience it by you wearing them or by you seeing someone else wear them. Ooh. That's up to you. That part is up to you. FOMO. Yeah, I think it's you either, you either regret FOMO. what you have done or what you have not done. Yeah. I think it's gonna be a lot a lot more regret on what you have not done. I think so too. You see somebody representing hey. in a shirt where you're like, oh, that's cool, I'm gonna pick one of those up. Like you can't. It's true, yeah. That's what the field is telling me as far as feedback goes, so yeah, I, I, I agree the with that. The field now. Yeah, the field, you know, the people. Check this out. The field. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like I said, jockostore.com. That's where you can get this cool stuff speaking of cool stuff <laughs> yeah, hell yeah you can subscribe yeah. to this hell podcast yeah. My man. Yeah. if you want to because echo seems to think that you haven't subscribed to it yet because you've been listening to f 285 episodes 287 know. episodes you never that's know. where you're at and you're like you know what maybe today's the night <laughs> Maybe I'm gonna get down. Hold on, let me whip out my iPhone and just hit subscribe. subscribe. Smash the subscribe button. Button. I don't, I don't think that's button. The way it's going, but yeah. So, anyways, yeah, we well. got this podcast. We got the Jocko Unraveling podcast with DC Daryl Cooper mm -hmm. of Martyr Made Fame. We got the Grounded podcast. We got the Warrior Kid podcast. We also have Jocko Underground, where we have a. A sovereign location, a virtual sovereign location. 
mm-hmm. where we will not be impeded upon by forces. We will we will do what we want mm-hmm. in the Jocko Underground. Look, hey, here's what's going on in the world. There's things happening on these platforms. There's things mm-hmm. happening on these platforms. We don't control the platforms. We don't control the platforms. There's a possibility that things could happen that could hurt what we're trying to do. Whether they start charging you money to listen on these platforms, whether they start inserting advertisements into the middle of us talking about World War I or, or Vietnam, and all of a sudden you're listening to an advertisement about um, uh, whatever, mattresses, mattresses right? That, so we don't want to have that happen. We definitely don't want to be censored mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So we gotta have an alternative platform. We made our own, jockounderground.com. Look, we hopefully we never have to go to it. Yeah. It's possible. But if we do, we'll be ready and we appreciate the support to get us ready. If you wanna subscribe to that, we do a little extra podcast and we answer a bunch of questions. We give some amplifying information. If you wanna join it, it costs $8.18 a month. And if you can't afford that, it's cool. Email assistance at jockounderground.com. We're just trying to, we, we're, we're here to hook you up if you need it. But we appreciate you hooking us up as well. Freedom isn't free, by the way. Yep. We got to maintain that freedom. We got a YouTube uh, channel. Yep. Speaking of smashing the subscribe button and freedom. Speaking of post, like, and comment. What is it? Post, uh, subscribe. Subscribe, like, and comment. Yeah. Would no, it be annoying if the like every video? That's what somebody's got to put in the front of it. Like and subscribe. That's what it is. And hit the notification. Comment bell. too. No, they say comment. Uh, oh yeah, and plus hit the notification. What are you doing, dude? Let me know in the comments. Yeah, let me know in the comments. And they always have some dumb uh, thing to talk about. Yes, you know most of the time. Yeah, you know I was thinking. I, I was, if you want to see more videos like this, go make. Let me know in the comments. Shut up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You know what? You're, you're, we'll just say, I, I'm not going to say you're salty. I'm not going to say that. Apparently you're I salty, am. but I'm, that's not what I'm saying. The reason that you feel what I think that you're feeling right mm-hmm. now about that is because it's like, it's super obvious, like what they're doing. They mm-hmm. want to like, they want the intel for the algorithm, right? The more mm-hmm. they want the engagement, right? Obviously, they want oh the comments, God. they want the likes, they want to, because that's for the algorithm so they can rate their video higher oh, so geez. they can, whatever. and you, we okay, know that, yeah. we know that, we're not even mad at that, really. I'm kind but, of mad at but it. But they're, no, but the, I think we or you are mad, quote unquote, at the part where they try to, like, fake like that's not it. They try to fake like, oh, yeah, you let me know, all I, you know, you're, you're oh, you know, we're talking you're to each the, other, we're yeah, friends, yeah. almost, kind of a feeling, and you're like, bah, you don't want to know. You yeah. don't want to know what I think, you know. Well, that's what it feels like. I can't read the guy's mind, so I don't know if he really wants to know or not. But that's how it feels. That's why I feel it too. Well, I'm a, I, I don't say uh, in the videos like comment, right. but I read the comments because they're funny. They are funny and they're yes. good. And some of them are interesting. Yeah, it's true. I've gotten some uh, good tips on books to cover and stuff from YouTube comments. Literally, that's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. So I'll read the comments because they're interesting. They're yeah. funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, YouTube comments kind of have a reputation. Well, mm-hmm. not kind of. Straight up, YouTube comments have the rep, the stigma of being like a cesspool of just n- like unreasonable negativity. But I think usually with our stuff, it's they're, they can be constructive most of the time. I'm down. Yep. So uh, if you want to leave a comment, leave a comment. Like, subscribe, smash. <laughs> 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 anyway, yes. Yeah, uh, so the point is, we shit. do have a YouTube channel. Yeah. So if you want to look at that, Allegedly. boom, there you go. Also, Psychological Warfare is an album that Jocko did. I recorded back in the day for the a purpose real hard of. Job you had there. Yeah, very hard. Uh, no, man, it was I helpful. recorded it. It was a very helpful. <laughs> you literally pressed record, bro. Yeah, that's like, what recording is. You press okay. record on the thing. You think everybody's like super pumped on that? <laughs> I think they're very impressed, yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, okay. the, it was recorded for the purpose of helping me through my moments of weakness. Mm-hmm. Then we added some other stuff about weaknesses that I don't have, but that other people might have, which turned out to be the case. So, yeah, if you have some moments of weakness, you want to listen to Jocko telling you how to get over them, boom, psychological warfare. If you want to see a visual representation of how to stay on the path, go to flipsidecanvas.com. Dakota Meyer, his company, he's putting all stuff, kind of cool stuff to hang on your wall. Good stuff. And plus it's Dakota Meyer, which is just 
well, it's Dakota Meyer. Got some books, Final Spin, coming out soon. Well, coming out in November, is that soon? Uh, Depending well, on when you're listening to this. Mm-hmm. So, Final Spin, novel, book, poem, transcript, what did the other thing you called it? Text, text. the text. Literature. 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 Sure, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want that first dish, get on it. Leadership Strategy and Tactics, the Code, the Evaluation, the Protocol, Discipline equals Freedom Field Manual, read a little bit of that today. Way the Warrior Kid, one, two, and three, for your kids, for your neighbor's kids. Just for every kid that you know, get them on the path when they're young. Mikey and the Dragons, About Face by Hackworth, which I wrote the forward to. Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership. Echelon Front, what do we do at Echelon Front, Dave? We solve your problems through leadership. That's what, about, what we do. What about problems that aren't leadership problems? If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. All your problems are leadership problems. I stole that though. Who'd you steal it from? Somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Go to echelonfront.com if you need help inside your company. That's what we do. We have efonline.com where we teach leadership principles online. This is your leadership gym. This is where you go in and get some sets, get some reps, get it done. Work up a little leadership sweat. Do some role playing. Ask some questions. We're there all the time. We have a, a... a conference that we put on. I don't know if that's the best word, but we have an event that we do. I don't even know if that's the right word. Anyways, there's a thing you can come to, mm-hmm. which is called the muster. We talk about leadership for two days. We do uh, activities. Come and check it out. Phoenix, August 17th and 18th. Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. We have something called the FTX coming up July 12th and 13th. If you want to check that out, it's tactical training with the emphasis on leadership, and you can take the leadership principles that we talk about all the time and apply them in a tactical environment, which will then you you will then be able to transfer to whatever environment you're in. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. And if you want to donate or you want to get involved, then go to America's Mighty Warriors. dot com. Dot org, sorry. And if you want to hear, if you want to hear more of this, of my cringingly long just reading of texts, <laughs> if you want to hear Echo Charles randomly ranting about God knows what. If you want to hear Dave getting hyped up on things that don't matter, (laughs) you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on the gram, on Facebook. Echo is at Echo Charles. Dave is at David R. Burke. And I am at Jocko Willink. And to all of the uniformed personnel out there in the military, who take these strategies and put them into action to protect our way of life. Thank you for what you do. And to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders, thank you for protecting our way of life here at home. And to everyone else out there, remember that Napoleon, the the great military leader, Napoleon Bonaparte, remember that he pursued his vision of peace for 20 years of war and ended up defeated and in exile. Don't do that. Don't do that. Think strategic. Adjust your ends to your means. Make sure you can actually win. Make sure you can see that pathway to victory. Make sure you can see those pathways, plural, to victory, and then start down that path and give it everything you got. And until next time, this is Dave and Echo and Jocko. Out.